Welcome back, YouTube. This is part three of the American Revolution, the shot heard around the world by me, Mark III, FMLE. Now let's talk about the pretext of this. Now, let's, a bit, let's zoom in on our little map of the route that the British took. Now, Dr. Joseph Warren, who had a friendship with General Gage's own wife, who was American born, and he found out what Gage was going to do before the troops were even deployed. Now, before escaping Boston itself, he warned Paul Revere and William Dawes to go out and warn everybody that the British were going to go and seize rebel ammunition and Concord all the way out here. Now, as many as 40 riders eventually participated and towns as far away as 25 miles were alerted to the British before they could ever get onto the boats, cross the Charles River to Cambridge, and then march to Concord. Now in the early morning hours, Colonel Francis Smith had 700 British troops. They boarded their craft, crossed the Charles River into Cambridge, then marched onto Concord. On the way to Concord was the town of Lexington. Lessington Militia under Captain John Parker, who was a French and Indian War veteran, he knew that he could not stop the British no matter what. His troops were inferior to begin with, and he knew that the Concord ammunition and guns were hidden so they wouldn't find anything and they would just go home like they did before. Over and over again, this is something that, that Gage had done many times before, and Parker think this wouldn't be any different. So, he sent most of his troops home on the notice that the British were not coming, but at about 4 in the morning, he did get a warning from another messenger saying that the British were indeed coming. But we need to realize that the colonists and the British both consider themselves to be British. So, I'm using this term in modern day terms. Anyway, so Parker knew that he could not stop the British when he knew they were coming. So he decided not to block the road and not to fire on them unless fired upon. And true to today's terms, the Marines led the way for the British up the road under Major Joseph Pitcairn, his junior officer, who was Lieutenant Jesse Adair. He brings his troops into line with the militia, who now only number about 80 men, since most of them had already gone home. And Captain John Parker heard the British were trying to get them to disarm and he tells his men to just go home, just forget about it but his men either didn't want to listen to him or they couldn't hear him because Parker was sick with tuberculosis in any case it became very tense and eventually a shot was fired nobody knows who fired it and many believe today as well as back then that the British didn't fire and the Americans didn't fire but someone in the buildings or in the woods had fired the shot which provoked both sides to fire on each other and this would be the first time that both colonials and and British actually fired on each other this is the Battle of Lexington Green it wasn't really a battle the British fired the Americans fired and the British then charged at the militia with bayonets the militia ran away the militia ran away and the British soldiers were restrained by their officers to get back on the road and head to conquer where they were supposed to go. But at that point, eight militiamen were dead and one British soldier was wounded in the thigh. After the brush at Lexington, the British marched to Concord, where the rebel ammunition and guns were stored. Now the Concord militia who had already assembled knew it wasn't worth fighting for the British in the city itself. So they ran off to the North Bridge just just north of Lexington across the Concord River and they decided on, to get on the high ground and wait for the British to see what they're gonna do now the British march into town they find some cannon and some food and they destroy it but the residents misled them a lot and they didn't find much of anything at all but they saw the militia across North Bridge and decided to go after them. At that point, the 
as they crossed the bridge, the Americans fired at them, poured relentless fire at them, and got the British to run away. And then, just as it seemed like it couldn't get any worse, militia units from different towns from all over the place, not just the Conquer militia, they arrived on the scene and they compelled the British to get the hell out of there. By noon, they were gone. Now, the panic happens. Here is our recreation of today of the North Bridge. This side would be American, this side would be British, across the Concord River. And now you get a little bit of visual on that. But as the British were retreating from Concord, the militia, in ever-growing numbers, fire at them all the way back. It got so bad that Colonel Smith considered surrendering his troops. He had a horse shot from out from under him. His officers were injured, his men were getting killed, and they couldn't retaliate on the Americans because the Americans would just run away or gallop away after firing their shots and retreating to reload and continue their attacks. But just then, Smith had ordered reinforcements or more troops from Boston early in the morning thinking that something might happen. Now when he got to Lexington, he found that Hugh Percy was there. General Hugh Percy and his army were there to rescue him. And, and, they, and, and Hugh Percy deploys units away from the road to keep the Americans away from the main body of soldiers who are retreating back to Boston. Now the retreat to Boston was much more bloody than the advance from it. More people died. The British protection parties who were the people who were protecting the main road from the American attacks, they ransacked taverns and killed occupants just on the thought that they were involved and might try to hurt the British. And at this point, homeowners fought from their own property and just it basically became a whole thing about everybody in the neighborhood came and took a shot. The British finally make it back to Boston in tatters. The British lose 80 men dead, the colonists 50. There were more wounded and captured, of course. And the siege of Boston begins. Here is a visual of Boston. Here is the Charlestown Peninsula. To the north, Dor Dorchester Heights to the south. The Massachusetts militia under William Heath, who would be replaced by General Artemis Ward, a aging militia commander, they surround Boston. New England troops and even Southern troops eventually arrive and bolster their numbers. The British, for their part, they wanted to allow the civilians to leave so the civilians would not starve, but they had to surrender their guns. And most of the people who left Boston were patriots. The loyalists stayed under British protection. The British had access to the sea, unquestioned access, but the militia had the numbers, and they controlled the heights and surrounded the town and unable to go into the countryside for food and for supplies, starvation and disease set in in Boston. At this point, prominent patriots offered to help. In the picture here is the prominent Connecticut merchant and a fellow veteran of the French and Indian War, Benedict Arnold. You might know that name, do not forget it. And to the right is the present day picture of Fort Ticonderoga. It was previously a French fort and it fell at huge numbers to British attacks. It was the most powerful fortress in North America but also very loosely guarded by a British garrison in the middle of the New York wilderness. Benedict Arnold presented his plan to catch Fort Ticonderoga. The Provincial Congress of Massachusetts allowed Benedict to raise troops to take the fort. He set, so he sets out into the wilderness by himself to recruit men along the way. He finds Ethan Allen and his Green Mountain Boys in the disputed Vermont territory. He had fought his own personal war to keep New Yorkers out of his territory, but now he had his own plans to do with Fort Ticonderoga. So when they meet, Arnold thinks he's going to command the operation. Arnold's but Ethan's militia is personally loyal to Ethan Allen, 
So they basically laugh in his face. So Arnold is basically regulated to second in the command. And they capture the fort without firing a shot on May 10th. The Green Mountain Boys then find all the booze and they get drunk. Now, it wasn't long before the British realized they had to get out of the city. In May of 1775, the British sent their three best generals and the army to Boston to help out Gage and to more or less replace him because he was too soft. Sir William Clinton, General William Howe, and General John Burgoyne. They arrived in Boston with more soldiers. At that point, Gage had drew up a plan to get out of the city by taking back the Charleston Peninsula up north. The Americans found out about this and they ordered Artemis Ward to fortify this area and prepare for a British attack. Now Clinton for his part he wanted to attack this little neck of land here and basically cut off all the men who could be in here. This was the easiest and less costly form of attack but the other generals overruled him favoring a show of force to get the Americans to come to their senses and stop fighting. Now, Gage had drew up the plans and the attack was on. The Americans found out about it and Artemis Hill was ordered to fortify Bunker Hill back here. However, there were only small fortifications and a mistake was made and they decided to fortify Breed's Hill instead. So the battle of Bunker Hill was not over Bunker Hill itself. And at that point, June 17th, the British Navy landed troops on the peninsula and went uphill against the Americans who were waiting for them. And here is the result. The British are ripped to pieces. The course of the battle, the British land and they launch three frontal assaults, as in they get their soldiers to march straight up a hill against right up right up against the American guns. They eventually seize the high ground because the Americans run out of ammunition and they have to withdraw. But the British are too beaten and exhausted to continue. This is called a perennic victory. And in military terms that means it's a victory you technically win, but all at the same time you take such heavy losses that it's not worth having another victory like that. Otherwise you'd lose the war. The aftermath of the battle was horrific. The Americans lost 450 men, including Dr. Joseph Warren. He himself was made a general of the militia, but he chose to fight as a soldier instead. During the last attack, he was shot through the head and bayoneted until unrecognizable by British soldiers who knew who he was. The British for their part lost about a thousand men including the Major John Pitcamp who led his troops at Lexington. The siege was not beaten and Gage was recalled to England and he was replaced by William Howe. Second Continental Congress which was due to meet May 10th if the intolerable acts were not repealed they did indeed meet and Georgia eventually joined them. So all 13 colonies eventually made it to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Another part of the Congress was they proclaimed George Washington as the commander of the new Continental Army. Now George Washington was not the most experienced man for the job, but he showed up at the Congress every day wearing his military uniform. The Congress also authorized the federal government, a federal government period, to print money provide for the defense, and to sign treaties. Now all the colonies will act as one. Now here's the first known portrait of George Washington in his Virginia Blues outfit from the French and Indian War. He arrived in Boston July 3rd and set about restoring order, cleaning things up, teaching, teaching officers how to actually do officer things, like buying supplies and restoring discipline in the ranks itself. He also authorized privateering, which is a friendly word for pirating, authorizing ships to attack British merchants and British vessels for supplies. 
He also authorized Benedict Arnold's invasion of Canada and Henry Knox's expedition to Fort Ticonderoga. But he also did something very bad too. Now some of the best soldiers in the militias in this new army that was surrounding Boston were black people, colored soldiers, freedmen, maybe even escaped slaves. They were in the militias as armed men as they were required to be by law. They fought at Lessonson and Concord and prominently at the Battle of Bunker Hill. Salem Poor, who was known to have killed Major John Pitcairn at the battle, was given lots of praise by his commanding officers for being a brave soldier. And these people were just as brave as their white compatriots. But at the same time, we lived in the 18th century world. Massachusetts decided to stop enlisting black soldiers. And then Washington, when he came in July, he adopted the same principle. Except it also included criminals, the elderly, and those who were unfit for service. This played right into the enemy's hands. Now Lord Dunmore was the royal governor of Virginia. When he found out about this, he realized he could bolster the British ranks, make the Americans fear a slave revolt, and to possibly wreck the American economy and get them to come to their senses. So he issued the Dunmore Proclamation in November of 75. It basically states that any slave who runs away and joins the British Army will be granted their freedom. Now bear in mind, most slaves back then could not read or write. But in any case, slaves ran away. And this would have major repercussions along the line, which we're going to be talking about as we go along. But as many as 20,000 blacks served in the British Army, but just as many would eventually serve in Washington's Army, because Washington found out about this, he saw what was coming, and decided to reverse his decision. Washington and then the Congress adopted the reenlistment of black soldiers. But, but southern colonies, such as South Carolina and Georgia, were resistant to arming actual slaves. While this was going on, George Washington was also coveting the great, vast supplies. Here's the invasion of Canada. Benedict Arnold assembled troops in Boston, including Daniel Morgan's regiment of riflemen. They set out across the Maine wilderness to reach Quebec, which was something that was never done before. The weather was turning foul, and a lot of troops turned back or succumbed to illness. But they also took back supplies as well. Only about 600 of the 1,100 men of Arnold's troops actually made it to Quebec. They were freezing and they were starving, but they made it November 9th. At the same time, Richard Montgomery from Ticonderoga captured Montreal and nearly captured the governor of Canada with his 300 troops, and they arrived on the other side of Quebec City on December 1st. Arnold knew he was outnumbered, so he decided to take action. He crossed the St. Lawrence River and demanded the city to surrender. Montgomery arrived with cannons, but it had little effect, so they decided to storm the city under the cover of a snowstorm on December 30th, 75. Here is the result. The British make it into the city itself, but they are shot up in house-to-house -house fighting. The battle was a disaster. At first, the British are overwhelmed, but firing from high positions, they eventually caught the Americans. Now the battle was a disaster. General Montgomery was killed. Bandit Arnold who was leading his troops with Daniel Morgan, he was shot through the leg and taken back. Daniel Morgan was surrounded and taken prisoner, as was Ethan Allen. Arnold refused to give up and he ordered a siege, even though he was all not only outnumbered, but also he didn't have enough food or clothing. And also the enlistments or the contracts of serving in the army were about to expire, but they also had to deal with disease and freezing temperatures. More soldiers under John Thompson make it to relieve Arnold and to give him more troops, but that's when Guy Carleton, the governor of Canada, decided to come out of the city and get the Americans out. 
At this point, the Americans did not want to fight at all, and they retreated May 6th. We also have to talk about the noble bookseller from Boston, Henry Knox. He joined the army, was made a colonel. He was not a military man, but he knew a lot about artillery from all his readings, so he was valuable. In November, Washington sent Knox to take the guns from Fort Ticonderoga, which were basically just sitting there, and to haul them to Boston. He arrived in late January after hauling those cannons in miles of snow, ice, and rivers. Now Washington wanted to send foot soldiers into Boston itself and just take the city. But Knox thought it could just be done by using cannon instead, which the Americans didn't have but knew they could get it. Now back to the map of Boston. Now on March 5th, Knox hauled the cannons up the Dorchester Heights here. In the morning, the British woke up and they saw the guns in Boston Harbor trained on the city and on the British ships in the water. The British tried to shell the American guns that were on Dorchester Heights, but their guns could not reach that far up. But also, the cannons on Dorchester Heights didn't fire, not only because the British threatened to burn the city if they were not allowed to leave in peace, but also the Americans didn't even have the gunpowder to fire the British. So it was a big lie, but it worked. But in any case, the cannons on Dorchester Heights were silent, and the British and the Loyalist colonists left. And the British would never see that place again. But they would be back. 